And uh, we're starting a new series because we need to. Uh, we need to be finished with the Bible's greatest hits, which was just great. But we're also starting this series um, called, um, what's it called? Finding Joy. Oh yeah, it's called Finding Joy. Well, hey, here's the reason it's been a tough year, right? It's been a tough year. I mean, it's been a tough year globally. I don't know about you, but for me personally, there have been some things that I've been kind of, you know, grinding away on and, and struggling through. And so I just thought, you know, we're coming to Christmas. Like, we should just have a fun one. We should just have a good one, right? Where it's just like joy. And when we leave church, it's like you don't feel guilty. You don't feel like, oh, i got to measure up or do something. Let's just leave and just go. We know that God is for us. We know that God has come to save us. We know that we are saved. We have eternal life. And that we should just have some joy in our lives. Amen? Like, I, I, you know, I know COVID won't let that happen, right? We, we won't be doing that, right? You can always tell the pre-COVID and then the during COVID like scenes, right? Now everybody would be wearing a face mask and they'd all be six feet apart, right? And there would be nobody eating there. But anyways, uh, you know, the malls, right? The malls are coming. The decorations are coming. The busyness is coming, even though I think this year might be a little bit busier. And of course, Pastor Scott alluded to this. The decorations are going up. Uh, some people have already put up the trees. How many people do nativity? How many people do a nativity set? Yeah. Anyone else? You guys have a, like a, okay. So uh, a number of years ago, because we've always done a nativity, and when the kids were really small, we did Fisher Price, right? I, you know, we couldn't afford Precious Moments. That was too expensive. Some of you guys have the Precious Moments one. Um, I think we had something else similar to that, and then we linked on to Fisher Price because the kids got it, right? So Fisher Price. But then a couple of uh, years ago, my wife said, for Christmas, I want a homemade, like, buy my family a homemade, because we used to always do homemade gifts, homemade uh, nativity set, right? And so that, you know, we, we did it, and, and I mean, it was, it was fun. I think I did most of it. Anyways, um, <laughs> Uh, but the kids and I, and you know, anyways, we, we kind of, I, I spent about $800 at Michael's, right, on crafts, just ribbons and blocks of wood, and I'm like, how did I spend $800 on this stupid thing? But of course, we, we did the nativity set, and you've seen it, right? You're, like, it's perfect. Uh, the, the, the one thing that I want to actually get to today is that something in the nativity is missing. Something in the nativity is missing, because here, here's, the, here's the story, uh, you know, Mary and Joseph right in the center with baby Jesus, right? Perfect. We need that. That's right in the story. And the little, uh, the, the, the threesome makes it really a pleasing, appeasing to the eye. So if you know anything about decorating, you put everything in, in triplets, right? And then on one side, you have the three wise men. Again, very nice, which is always balanced out by shepherds. And there's usually three shepherds. So you got three groups of three, which to the eye just falls nicely. And then you have maybe a cow that's uh, on a lower level over here and a donkey or maybe a sheep and, you know, maybe a couple of children or something. And it just looks amazing. And to top it all off, you have either the star on the top of the nativity or you have the angel. And the angel is kind of telling a story. And you're just like, that's the nativity. What I'm here to tell you today is there's something drastically missing from a nativity set and I don't know how we're going to fix this. I don't know who to go to. I don't know how, like, should we start a petition? But literally, if you read your Bible, there is something missing from the nativity set. And so as we start our series on joy, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but joy is all throughout the Christmas story. And I would say joy more than salvation is the story of Christmas. I think salvation is the story and the theme of Easter, but the story of Christmas is joy. And I'm going to prove it to you. So you might be asking, who is missing from the nativity set? Well, I'll just, I'll just spoil it right off, right off, right out of the gate, right out of the gate. There's three people, and, and that's the, the thing. Like, you could just do it in three, and it'd be perfect. But Zechariah and Elizabeth and John, baby John the Baptist are missing from the nativity set. That's in the story of Christmas. If you read the, the Gospel of Luke... Chapter 1, and I've made the mistake because on the screen it says chapter 2, but it's chapter 1. All of chapter 1 is about John the Baptist. He is the one that comes before Jesus. The prophets foretold somebody coming before the chosen one, the Messiah. And this is John the Baptist. And so chapter 1 is all John the Baptist. Chapter 2 is all Jesus. Chapter 3, we go back to John the Baptist again. This was significant in the time. And somehow along the way, we've missed out on this piece of the story. Are you intrigued? Are you piqued? What in the world is this guy talking about? Nativity with 
extra people? I don't know. We should petition. We'll do something. We'll figure it out. John the Baptist. John the Baptist. And, and the, the, the reason why I think this is somewhat significant is because, you know, in our Christian walk, we can do all the right stuff, and we can attend, and we can give, and we can serve, and we can, you know, kind of follow the rules. And somewhere along the line, the joy just goes out of it. And so much like the nativity scene, much like, uh, you know, the nativity scene, Maya, Zachariah, and Elizabeth, and, uh, and John the Baptist baby, uh, joy is missing from our Christian walk. And my prayer is, is that much like, you know, this uh, flash mob that we just saw, we're just kind of busy going about our thing, and then all of a sudden God's just going to come in and sing the Hallelujah Chorus and restore some joy. So here's the story of John the Baptist. You guys good for reading the Bible today? Okay, we're good for that? All right, if you're not, then I don't know how to help you because that's what we're going to do. Uh, this is right out of the gate in the Gospel of Luke. And of course, Luke, you know, there's four different Gospel writers, and they all come at it from a different angle. Luke was the guy who actually went and he studied. He actually asked people. He interviewed them. He did this kind of like process. He was the only one also that wasn't a Jew. So he was a Gentile, and he was writing about this story from a Gentile's perspective. He was also a doctor. So he was very detailed in his account. And so he starts his Gospel... And uh, tells why he's writing, and then he jumps right into this missing story from the nativity. And he says, in the time of Herod, the king, uh, Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah, who belonged to the priestly division, division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. So you're kind of like, okay, yeah, big deal, who are these people? Okay, just what, the, between the lines here, these people were the go-to people in church. These people were there every Sunday. These people were devout. These people were upstanding. People liked these people. People respected these people. And not only that, they respected them. Uh, it'll, you'll see in the next verse. They respected them because of their actions, but they also respected them because of their lineage. Lineage is everything to the Hebrew people. And Elizabeth was literally a descendant of Aaron, the brother of Moses. Like, that's pretty significant. When you get that far down the line and you're still connected to Aaron, who was the first priest Abijah also was, was a great priest as well, and Zechariah was a descendant from him. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, and they observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. You think these people should just not have a care in the world, everything should be going right for them, they should just have, you know, just free passes everywhere. They're good people, they're from this line, they, they're good upstanding, you know, and all of these things, we, we should, they, they should just have a free pass. But watch what happens in the next verse. But they were childless. They were childless, which in that day, in that age, in that society, if you were childless, you were seen to have some kind of sin, or there was a curse on your life somehow, or something went wrong somewhere, and people would kind of like shun you, mock you, whatever. It, it, was, it was a bit of a problem. And so Elizabeth uh, was not able to conceive, and now they're both old. So not only are they childless, can't have a kid, cursed, but it's not going to happen. That ship has sailed. That ship has sailed. So this is a great setting, right, for the story. Because when it's hopeless, that's when God can move. Right? When all hope is gone. When it's the bleakest. When it's the darkest. When you've just been grinding it out and you're just doing your level best to serve God. And it just, it just doesn't feel good. And you can kind of get that sense in this story already that there wasn't a whole lot of joy happening for Zechariah and for Elizabeth. They were doing the right things, but they weren't feeling the joy necessarily. So once when Zechariah's division, he was a div part of the whole division of priests, was on duty, he was serving as a priest before God. He was chosen by lot, so they just rolled dice, and it's like, okay, Zechariah, you're up. According to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. Again, more context, if you didn't know what the temple was, there was the outer gates, and then there was the inner gates, and then there was the Holy of Holies. Inside the Holy of Holies was where real worship happened before the Lord, and only um, special priests could go into the Holy of Holies. And so they had to burn incense all the time, and so, of course, this division was chosen, and then Zechariah was chosen by Lot, and he went in to burn incense before the Lord. And what's happening, it's kind of like this service, where there's people standing around, and we're just waiting in worship for Zechariah to go in, do his thing, offer the sacrifice to the Lord, and then come back out, and then we can continue on with our worship service. So, when the time came for the burning of incense, 
All the assembled worshipers were praying outside. So Zechariah is inside, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. Dang. Can I just say dang in that moment? Because I know we read this like, oh yeah, just whatever. Like, imagine if you were doing your, your Christian worship, and then all of a sudden, an angel just showed up. Right? Dang. Okay. And, like, there's only one word. It's the Hebrew word, dang. Uh, <laughs> then the angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zacharias saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. Because you would be, right? You ever heard about these angel people? They're scary. The angel said to him, and this is what all angels say in the Bible, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, and check this out. Your prayer has been heard. Your prayer has been heard. So, again, we could just gloss this over, but what prayer is that? What prayer is Zechariah offering? Or what prayer did Zechariah offer when he was younger? Right? When he was like, I just want to be a dad. I just want to have a son. I just want to have somebody to pour my life into. And I bet you he and Elizabeth prayed time and time again, God, would you just send us, send us a son. We're just so desperate to have a baby. And uh, a little, like, God is never late, always on time, but this might, to Zachariah, seem a little late. Your prayer has been heard. Oh, that prayer that I prayed 40 years ago? Are you kidding me? Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you will call him John. More on that later. He will be a, he will be a joy. Right? He will be a joy. You know, dads and sons and joy. He will be a joy and a delight to you and Many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. So it's like, yeah, you're going to have, you're going to have a, a son. You're gonna, you're, he's going to bring you joy and delight and to other people. And he's going to be great in the sight of the Lord. It's basically, he's going to be a priest just like you, but he's going to be great in the sight of the Lord. You know, the, the idea here, like, I don't know if you can just, like, Obviously, Zachariah's mind would just be going six ways to Sunday. He'd be just like, what is going on? I don't even understand any of this. Who are you and why are you saying this to me? I just had to light the candles and get out of there. I just slipped into my Jerry Seinfeld. But, but he would have been just elated. If you kind of just step back and think about, he wanted a son. He was a priest. His son was going to be a priest and great in the sight of God. I, I started to kind of ruminate on this, and I thought, what if Pastor Scott got married? Right? There's a little... Everybody's like, oh, I was sleeping, and now I'm awake. What, what if Pastor Scott actually got married, and then him and his wife had a son, and that son was kind of like Wayne Gretzky. And then just by chance, he got drafted by the wicked Ottawa Senators. Right? And then the Ottawa Senators just went on a run and won six. Can you imagine how proud Pastor Scott would be? He would just be like, that's my boy. That's my boy right there. Because I'm an Ottawa Senator. I love hockey. And that's my boy. And I take great delight in him. But here's the Stanley Cup. And you just, his heart would be pounding out of his chest. I think that's probably just a little bit of what Zachariah was going through here. He's like, are you kidding? This is actually going to happen? And he, all of the things, just going six ways to Sunday. So this is his response. And this probably would be most of our response. Well, the angel goes on a little bit. He says, he, was, he is never to take wine or for other fermented drink. And he will be, check this out, this is a pattern. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he's born. Oh, that powerful. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. He's going to be so influential. He, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit of, uh, and power of Elijah, who was one of the greatest prophets that Israel had ever seen, to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous and to make ready a, a people prepared for the Lord. So it's like not only are you going to have a son whom you're going to delight in and who's going to be a blessing to many and great in the sight of the Lord, but he's, his extreme purpose is to prepare the way for the Messiah because the Messiah... Yes, the long-awaited Messiah is on his way. And your son 
is going to pave the way for him. And Zachariah is just like, are you kidding me? So this is what we would all have said, probably through stammering lips. Zachariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. <laughs> right? I think he's very diplomatic. Smart guy. I don't know who is listening. My wife is well along in years. So, and then, this is part of scripture where I don't necessarily get, because it seems like Gabriel gets a little angry with him. And I didn't know angels had emotions. But Gabriel said to him, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. It's kind of like, you dummy. You know, why are you asking me questions? Uh, and now you will be silent and not able to speak until the, the, uh, the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. So I don't know if you check that out or not, but Pastor Scott gets married, has a child, or an angel comes to him and says, you're going to have a child, it's going to be like Wayne Gretzky, and, and Ottawa Senators are going to kill for like 10 years, and he's going to be the best player and all that kind of stuff, but you can't tell anybody. You can't tell anybody. And so, he would just be, he would be on social media, like his thumbs would be worn down to little nubs, right? He'd be just texting everybody he knows. And so while all of this is happening, meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed in the temple so long. And then it goes on. When he came out, he could not speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. And when his time of service was completed, he returned home. And that's the end of Act 1 in our drama today. Crazy, right? Crazy stuff that's happening here. I can't imagine his excitement. I can't imagine his frustration at not being able to communicate what he had just experienced and the information that he just had. But more importantly, I can't imagine his joy the more he thought about this. And he was just like, are you kidding me? Are you, we're going to have a kid? We're going to have a baby? We've always wanted to have a... And he's going to be great in the sight of... It's going to be a delight and help lots of people. And Jesus is coming and the Messiah is on the way. And he would have just been like, every night, he probably couldn't sleep. He was probably just so excited. What's this baby going to be like? And what, how's, he, how's he going to talk? And what's he going to act like? Am I ever going to get my voice back? Like, he probably had all of these things going on in his head. Incidentally, Elizabeth is pregnant for about five months. And then, in that meantime, part of the Christmas story, the angel goes to visit Mary. Right? And then they have their own, which we'll talk about in a week or two. But they have their own little meeting, the, the angel and Mary. And then we pick up in Act 2 what happens next with Elizabeth. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zachariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. Check this out. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Spirit. So now we got John in the womb filled with the Spirit. Now we got Elizabeth being filled by the Spirit just because John uh, leapt in her womb. And I, I said this in the first service, like I've never been pregnant even though I might have looked at it, looked like it from time to time. Uh, but the, the whole baby thing, uh, you know, Carolyn, when kids were inside and, and they would kind of like be moving around and stuff, and it just kind of weird because it looked like a little bit of an alien in there, right? And like the odd foot would be just sticking out. But obviously Elizabeth had, well, she was having that experience, but it, th she was like, you know, you know, this isn't just like a foot kind of sticking out. This is like the baby jumped. You know, this was something significant. This was something completely different at the sound of Mary's voice. So you got Elizabeth with John the Baptist and Mary with the baby Jesus, and they come together. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of God is doing something very significant. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child that you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for, leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord will fulfill his promises to her. So hold it there for a second. There's a bunch right here. The, the, the beauty of this is, you know, we get this impression that Mary ran to, to Elizabeth. And Mary said, oh, I don't know what to do. This angel visited me. And she told her the whole story. And, and Elizabeth's like, there, there, dear. We'll figure it all out. Just, you know, just stay with me for a couple of months. And just like kind of like walking her through the process. But what ended up happening was 
When Mary came in and she said, Elizabeth, John the Baptist jumped for joy. And in that moment, uh, Elizabeth was filled with the Spirit and God revealed to her that Mary was carrying the Messiah. And so she says, oh my God. And she doesn't say, oh, thank God that I have the baby. She's like, I can't believe that I'm this close to the one who's going to save the world. Isn't that insane? And I love this last part. Because if there was anybody that could have said, God, you know what? I, we prayed, man. We prayed. We, we served you faithfully. And then I got old and I couldn't have babies and I really wanted to have a baby. And so, God, you're not a God who fulfills his promises. But she is so filled with joy. This is the statement that she makes. Blessed is she who believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. She's like, God fulfills his promises. God comes through. He might not come through in my time. He might not come through in my way, but God fulfills his promises. And when she realized that, she was just filled with joy. So you got John filled with the Spirit, jumping for joy. You got Elizabeth filled with the Spirit, jumping for joy. Check out what happens next. This is, this is actually Act 3. So uh, obviously some time passes when Elizabeth, when it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. No doubt, because the angel already told her that. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. The joy is starting to spread. And on the eighth day, you see how it's a theme? Like, you guys didn't even know this was in part of the Christmas story, but already three times it's been mentioned, joy, joy, joy. It's, it's not like love, 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 or any other emotion. It's all about joy. That's why I say Christmas is all about joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zachariah. But his mother spoke up and said, no, he's to be called John. So they said to her, this, this, uh, there is no one among your relatives who has that name. And they uh, made signs to his father to find out what he would like, uh, what he would like to name the child. And he asked for the, a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote his name as John. See, names, we, we name, like, I have a little namesake now, right? Liam, Liam Robert, right? And, uh, you know, names, nah, they're significant, but not as significant as those days. We talked about this at Alpha on Thursday night. We were talking about it, and we're just like, what's in a name? You ever notice when somebody has an encounter with God, a real encounter, that God changes their name? And then they go forward, and they're, diff they're different people. Or when God wants to do something brand new, he has this whole thing about names, i.e. in the Christmas story, Jesus. You shall call him Jesus, right? Emmanuel, God with us, has significance. What is the significance of John here? The significance of John, number one, is usually the son took the father's name. You know, you ever seen it in uh, scripture where it says son of um, uh, Peter Barjonas? Right? Peter, son of John. Everybody was like, right? So, anyways, that kind of disproves my point because it would have been John, son of John. But anyways, there was this big, huge trend where they would call him, and obviously in this culture, they were calling him after Zechariah. And they said, his name has to be Zechariah. He said, no, his name is going to be John because that's what the angel, that's what the angel told me to call him. Never before in the Bible had anyone been called John. God was doing something brand new. Never before was not only a, a person named John, but was a prophet named John. What? I thought all the prophets were supposed to have these special names and priests were supposed to, no. God is doing something new. He's fulfilling his promise, he's doing something new. And the name John in Hebrew literally means God is gracious or God gives gifts, which is kind of crazy. And it's kind of crazy when you think about the naming of John and then you connect it with the name Zechariah and Elizabeth because they have meanings as well. You want to think about promises? You want to think about God keeping his promise? The name Zechariah literally means in Hebrew, the Lord has remembered, or the Lord remembers. Remember when he said, the Lord has heard your prayer. And God just tucked that away and said, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use that. 
It's not going to happen in Zechariah's time, but I'm going to blow his mind one day. What's this? The Lord remembers his prayer. The, the, the name Elizabeth means the Lord, or my God, is an oath. So if you put, you put Zechariah and Elizabeth together, you get the Lord remembers his oath. And if you get John in the mix there, it's my God is gracious and remembers his oath and gives good gifts. And you think about Christmas and you just go, yeah, dang. I, I, I know it's hard. I know dark sometimes. I know there's a grind. I know that sometimes the, the joy kind of feels like it, it goes out. But I, I, I'm praying that through these words and through these stories and through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that we will be filled yet again with the Holy Spirit and we will be filled with the joy of the Lord. That we will know the significance of just who we're in relationship with here. And we can just be excited about it and be joyful about it, even though it's still dark. Because the Lord God remembers his oath and is gracious. Isn't that good? So, Zechariah, I think we're near the end. It says, immediately his mouth was open and his tongue was set free and he began to speak. And I love this. He was praising God. You know, all the neighbors were filled with awe throughout the hill country in Judea, and people were talking about all these things, and everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, what then is this child, uh, what is, then is this child going to be? And um, for the Lord's hand was with him. And, hey, you know, it immediately comes to my mind, well, we sing, you know, the Jesus song, What Child Is This? And they're literally saying the same thing about John the Baptist, right? In the same story, what then is this child? And then, get this, Zechariah goes off. Mary wrote a song, and Zechariah also wrote a song, and he just, he just goes off. He gets pretty passionate here as he writes this, and here are the lyrics. You know, Luke went and uh, interviewed him, and Zechariah's like, yeah, I still have the lyrics to that song I wrote after the angel loosed my tongues and I started praising God. Oh, cool. Could I, could I get those lyrics and put them in my book? Sure you can. And then 2,020 years later, we can read them. So here it is. It's, uh, it's Luke 1, 67, and his, his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit. Drop side. So if you're not tracking, that was John in the womb, that was Mary when, or that was Elizabeth when Mary came, and this is now Zechariah after his tongue was released. He says, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. Not sure what that is. Is that a Mary? Oh, that's a battery. Pass me that, Mike. Thank you. I'll just go with this berry from here on out. Oh yeah, check one, two. Okay, yeah. This one sounds better, anyways. Praise be the Lord. Uh, he has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. And he's saying, hey, he's fulfilling. He's fulfilling his promises, as he said through his holy prophets long ago. Salvation from our enemies and from, from the hand of all who hate us. To show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant. Watch what it, watch what it does here. The oath, the oath he swore to our father Abraham. The, the Elizabeth that he swore to our father Abraham to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, and you will go on before the Lord to prepare a way for him and to give people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. And because of the tender mercy of our God, by, the, by which the rising of the sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide our feet to path, the path of peace. And then the last verse, number 80, it says, And the child grew and became strong in spirit and lived in the wilderness until he appeared publicly to Israel. I missed the piece, I think, in, uh, yes, verse 72. It says, To show mercy. I don't know, if, Tori, if you can put it up there. To show, just check this out, because he literally uses his name and... Elizabeth's name in the verse 72 and 73. It says to show mercy to our ancestor and to remember, or to Zechariah, which is the same thing, to remember his holy covenant. And then the next, verse 73, it says the oath he swore to our father, Abraham. The plan 
is all coming together and it brings brings us great joy brings us great joy my time is 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 basically gone and I want to close but I want to I want to leave you with this because what what ends up happening is about 30 years later Jesus arrives on the scene and Jesus comes to John the Baptist and even though they're cousins uh, you know John the Baptist looks at Jesus and says behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and then John actually baptizes Jesus and then Jesus goes away and then comes back and starts his ministry his earthly ministry which is famous, and then from there, you know, Jesus went on to do incredible things, obviously, and, and that's what the Bible, you know, the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are all about. But before Jesus started his ministry, John had a significant ministry, had a huge following, so much so that the, the historian Josephus read or wrote about him way back in antiquity. This guy was a big deal. He was a rock star of his time. He had a huge following and was baptizing lots of people and doing exactly as the prophet as the, as the angel had said. But when Jesus started his ministry, there became this kind of competition. Right? There was this little, like, my church is bigger than your church thing. Okay? You guys didn't know this, but, like, man, there was, like, some tension in the church world when Jesus started his ministry. And we read about it in John chapter 3. It says, after this, Jesus and his disciples went out to the Judean countryside where he spent some time with them and baptized. Now, John also was baptizing at um, Anon uh, near Salem because there was plenty of water and people were coming to be baptized and being baptized. This was before John was put in, in prison. And check this out. An argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. So they came to John and they said, Rabbi, the man who was with you, i.e. Jesus, on the other side of the Jordan, the one who you testified about, the lamb who takes away the sin of the world, look, he's baptizing and everyone's going to him. It's like, we used to have this big, huge church, but now people are church hopping, <laughs> right? Like, well, Jesus is a better preacher. He does better baptisms than John. John is old passe. He's boring. We're going to go to the new fancy place. And, and so all John's disciples are like, are, are you okay with this? Check out what he says. This is so amazing. When you think about Christmas, you think about John the Baptist, you think about the theme of joy. To this, John replied, and I think this next sentence was brought to him by his parents. He says, a person can receive only what is given to them from heaven. Right? You think about the parents, and they're like, tried and tried and tried to have babies. And then when heaven decided, it's time, we're going to answer that prayer. And so I feel like he learned that one sentence from his parents. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but I am sent ahead of him. And he's preparing the way. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. But the friend who stands, uh, who attends the bridegroom, awaits and listens for him. And is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. He's like, that joy is mine and is now complete. And then check out this next line. He must become greater and I must become less. It's kind of like, you know, the best man at the wedding when his friend marries the woman of his dreams. He's just filled with joy. I'm so excited for my buddy. I'm so excited that he's, you know, married. He's tied the knot with this woman that he loves so much. I'm just so, so excited for him. And that's what, that's what John is saying literally here. He's saying, you know what, what Jesus is doing and the fact that Jesus is, is kind of moving ahead with the mission that he came to accomplish is exactly why I was here in the first place. And so seeing him take off and seeing his ministry take off brings me great joy because I know the plan of the Lord is working. It is incredible. And he goes, all of this just makes me so happy because I see God is doing. And then he says these amazing words. He says, he must get greater. He must become greater and I must become less. So before you run out and buy another nativity and maybe add a few more characters, uh, let me give you three little thoughts just to move forward. We know that God is with us. We know that even though it's hard, we know that there's a God and he loves us and he wants us to have joy just based on this one story, just the theme of it all. So I want you just to be watching for it, be looking for it, be excited when the Lord comes your way and just fills your heart with joy this Christmas season. 
But there's three things I want you to just keep in, in mind. Number one is, is be joyful, but be patient in the waiting. Be patient in the waiting. Because it's like, God, I want the answer, and I want it right now. God is inviting you through this story to be patient in the waiting. He has heard your prayer. He has heard your prayer. And the answer, the answer is on the way. Some things just take time and everything happens in the Lord's time. So just because it hasn't happened or just because the struggle is still here, don't let it rob your joy because the end has not been written just yet. Amen? Amen. Be patient. Number two is keep on serving the Lord. I, I love the story of Elizabeth and Zechariah. I love the story of Jesus, and I think her name is Hannah. And remember Hannah, when Jesus comes on the eighth day, and Hannah peeks out behind the curtains, and she's like, oh, I've seen the glory of the Lord. And then Simeon is there, and he's dedicating Jesus, and he's like, I can die now because the Messiah is here. And they're just like, oh, my goodness. Uh, I think they were just serving the Lord so diligently and faithfully. Elizabeth and Zechariah were the same even though in the world's eyes they might have looked cursed, they kept going to church. They kept serving faithfully. They kept doing what God was asking them to do. And maybe even the joy was gone. And they stuck with it long enough to find the joy once again on the other side. Keep on trusting. Keep on serving. Keep on worshiping persevere through your faith. So be patient in the waiting, keep serving the Lord, and keep on being filled with the Spirit of God. Never before have I connected the, the Spirit's infilling with the Christmas story, but it's pretty evident through this story that all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit of God. All of them were filled with the Spirit of God. So, you know, number one, I think the easy application here is just open yourself up and just say, Holy Spirit, would you come? Would you come into my life in greater measure? Holy Spirit, just, just, you know, take over my life. I just open myself up to you. Would you come? God might just baptize you on the spot. But here's the thing. When you connect it to what John said, his very last words were, he must become greater and I must become less. You know, Everything in our world that's empty, it all is about us, isn't it? Everything in our world that's empty is always about us. It's about selfishness. It's about making me better or me happier. I'm going to do this. I'm going to buy this because it's going to make me happy. And then we don't find any joy in it. Or that we find that the joy kind of, you know, dissolves over time. When you have the Holy Spirit, yeah, it's a whole different ballgame. When, when he increases and we decrease, it's amazing the change that actually happens. And if you've lived in that place and you know that place, you know it to be true. You know it to be true when it's all God in my life. Man, you can almost walk through anything, can't you? And the joy stays with you. So just remember this Christmas season that God is gracious and he remembers his oath. And whatever promise promise you're waiting on whatever you're waiting on God to do just keep on serving him keep on trusting him keep on being filled with the spirit and be patient and joyful in the waiting let's pray together father we thank you so much for this story we thank you so much for this message lord it's inspiring it's encouraging it's full of joy this theme of joy is so profound and god i pray that to a person in this room today, even though 2020 has been a year of just slugging it out and, and just, uh, Lord, just sort of darkness and, and grinding and just, Lord, there's been really not a whole lot of encouraging news even all around the world. We pray, Lord, that you would help us be people of joy because we know Jesus and we serve Jesus. And Lord, it wouldn't be fake. We wouldn't be trying to be fake and we wouldn't deny, Lord, our emotions and those things. But Lord, that we would just find the strength that comes from you through this powerful thing called joy. And God, through these next six weeks, would you just continue to teach us and, and, and help us learn and add to our lives, Lord, this element of joy. We thank you for this. We pray it all in the strong and amazing, wonderful name of Jesus. And everybody said together, 